This is episode episode 345 with guest Hugh Carp from Nexus Mutual. This is Brian Crane. And this is Sunny Agarwal. And today we're talking with Hugh Carp of Nexus Mutual. I guess you could say we have a little bit of a insurance theme going on right now because last week we just did an episode with Open. And today with uh, Nexus Mutual, we explore sort of a different form of how to do insurance, maybe a model that's more familiar to most people in what they think of insurance, which is this mutual concept where people sort of buy in and pay premiums and then they can make claims. And, you know, unlike unlike Open, it's much more sort of linked to the real world. They have a more complex DAO structure where it's connected to a real world company. And so, you know, it, it seems like a little bit more of a bringing the existing system, but recreating it into a DeFi, into a decentralized manner. Yeah. So this was great fun. I mean, I remember speaking with you and I mentioned at the start of the episode around four years ago, I think when he was just starting to work on Nexus Mutual and I, and I thought, you know, this was interesting and it's amazing to see how far they've come. And yeah, I thought this was really cool, especially the idea that, you know, we're going to speak about this example as well, as well right? That you can go and compound and you can lend out, let's say some, uh, you know, fiat stable coin and then you can buy insurance for uh, for it on on Nexus Mutual, you know, for the case that there's some bug and uh, the contract loses its value. So this is a really cool use case, and yeah, I'm impressed. I think this is like one of the coolest DApps that I've covered in an Epicenter episode. Cool. So uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy the episode. We're here today with Hugh Carp. He is the founder of Nexus Mutual and uh, also a board member of it. So we're going to speak a bit about kind of the, the structure of Nexus Mutual. I, I'm really excited about this. I remember vaguely, you know, having spoken with you, I think around four years ago about Nexus Mutual when it was like at the very, very beginning. It was really exciting today to catch up on all the amazing progress that has happened. And uh, just also kudos. The website and the documentation are just really well written and very, very clear. So well done. Thank you. No, we've been at it for a while, but yeah, it's great to be out there and actually providing use to to people in the DeFi space, especially right now. So yeah, really great to be here. So you have a, a long background in insurance. Tell us a bit about like what was your insurance work like and how did your interest in blockchain come about? I'm an actuary by training and I, I studied actuarial science um, at a university in, in Australia and yeah, worked for qualified as an actuary and then worked for 10 years in life companies in Australia doing various roles, pricing and reserving and product development and a whole bunch of different things and getting more and more into the marketing side a bit later on when I was, was there, including that and then switching to doing M&A deals and a whole bunch of different stuff. 2012, I moved to London and joined um, Munich Re, which is, yeah, one of the, I guess, one of the largest reinsurance companies in the world, and ended up working in their life division in the UK and um, did a few different roles, but ended up being the, the CFO for their life operations. So kind of ran a team of about 30 people, actuaries, accountants, analysts, and stuff like that, and did all manner of things, capital arbitrage and shifting money around balance sheets and doing all that stuff kind of really at the back end of the insurance value chain so that was kind of really interesting for a while but I did get a little jaded at the end because it was kind of it was a bit far away from like the real impact on people and like actually it felt a bit too abstract to me sometimes I guess that's kind of the insurancey stuff a quick whiz through on that but I, on the kind of blockchain piece I, you know, stumbled across Bitcoin about 2010, I think, and, you know, just kind of went down the rabbit hole, started playing around. I do remember I had absolutely no idea what I was doing and, you know, was kind of mining on a, a web-based miner. I'm doing some really, really basic stuff, storing private keys on um, public internet <laughs> websites and stuff. It was just, I remember doing like all the things you shouldn't be doing. Played around with it for a while. I found it really fascinating that especially you could send money from one person to another without 
anyone else in the middle. That just kind of really blew my mind a bit. And then I guess I didn't really know what to do with it because I guess payments wasn't really my thing. And I found the tech fascinating, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't really know what I could personally do with it. So I, I put it down and, and honestly, I didn't really come back to it and for quite a while. I think it was kind of late 2015 or early 2016 that I kind of heard about Ethereum and kind of started getting back into things and investigating and, and stuff. And I, I think that's kind of when it really kind of clicked for me because, you know, if you can write an if then statement, then you can write an insurance contract. I kind of like really kind of started doing research and stuff then. And I mean, that was kind of the early stages of, I guess, Nexus and the idea formation and stuff. So yeah, that's kind of the, the brief history. So back when you were at uh, some of the, you know, more legacy insurance companies, uh, were they at all like interested in blockchain stuff or were even if the company itself wasn't, were there like murmurings amongst individuals or other people really interested in this or not really? I think it was, I mainly only talked about it when I was at Muni Cree. Um, so I can only really comment from that point of view, but it was definitely a topic of conversation. You know, it's new tech. It's on the, you know, on the kind of roadmap of things to look into. And they always got the, you know, scanning stuff on the horizon and things so that they look into it. I guess blockchain was kind of always lower down the priority list than other things that were, that are more kind of specific insurance stuff. So like IoT or AI or machine learning type stuff is kind of always a bit higher up the list in terms of priorities. I think blockchain got put in the bucket of this is a potentially useful tech, especially in the insurance world where things are very interconnected. But it was more in the bucket of this could save operational expenses. And there are a lot of potential technology solutions that can do that. So it would be competing against a whole bunch of different things. So it never kind of really got the high level focus there were a couple of us that were always talking about it because we were kind of deep in the rabbit hole maybe a bit more on the crypto side but it, it didn't tend to really get much traction within the in the companies at the time i was uh, working with a company monax which was started doing kind of enterprise theorems they started in 2014 but i was there like 15 and 16 and that was, you know, significant part of the interest was from insurance company. And, you know, there was like pilots and lots of conversations with insurance company, including Munich Re. Right? There was uh, Marcus there who was who later, there was also this insurance consortium spun up. We spent quite a lot of time back then. And, and there seemed to be many also doing various like pilots and projects. Maybe from the outside, it looked like they were quite interested, maybe even more so than banks from our vantage point, but maybe from the inside, it looked different. But I'm curious, how has this all progressed? Like what has come of these things? Are any things here going like live in production being used today or has this kind of died off? There are a few that are alive today and working. I think it's fair to say that everyone was like very interested because it's a new tech and it can do something fundamentally new. So they all wanted to get in and make sure they could understand. And perhaps cynically, it's so they can answer to their bosses what the when the question comes. And they'll want to run a pilot to really kind of get into the details. But I think it, then the step of taking it from the pilot to the next stage of actual implementation in a real case, that's a, there's a massive drop off there. I think there's a few that are actually live. So B3I are doing, they've got a live product now where they're um, essentially running this consortium amongst the different um, reinsurers and insurers where you place like excess of loss catastrophe insurance on chain. And it, I mean, it actually works quite well because you can coordinate the placement. There's like, you know, if you want to take a huge risk, you kind of slice it and dice it between different entities in the insurance world and coordinating all the paperwork and who's on for what risk is actually a large part of the problem. And so blockchain is quite good at kind of notarizing that stuff and making sure that the sign offs are all done and, you know, you're not shipping paper around and all the, all the time. So that's working quite well. I think there's also a, um, a Maersk one, which is um, kind of shipping supply chain type stuff, which is an interesting problem because when the ship moves into different waters and different jurisdictions, different people are on risk. And so you have to kind of know exactly where the ship is and like, you know, tags and stuff like that. So it's basically about data integrity and those types of things, which amongst multiple parties. So, you know, blockchain works in that context. A lot of like what B3I and stuff is doing is sort of helping coordinate these like existing insurance companies. And, you know, like you said, making their operational costs lower. But then you took a sort of very different route where, you know, you went a very crypto native, crypto first, like rebuilding insurance from scratch. 
maybe all of your colleagues who were also interested in crypto went down this very more private blockchains approach. What drove you to building like public decentralized on Ethereum? To me, it was always a very natural fit, I guess. Like basically insurance is a coordination problem and it's an intangible good. It's like you can actually have it running on a blockchain very natively and it works really well because um, essentially blockchains are good at coordinating people and especially incentive mechanisms. And then because it's no, there's no physical, necessarily any physical good, it's it really kind of fits natively like a currency in some ways. So there was always this very natural fit. And I also saw that there was like massive inefficiencies in the current system about moving capital around and also just paper administration and stuff. And so I saw that there was a big opportunity there. And I guess the other thing was, I also noticed that all insurance companies really do custody money on behalf of people. So essentially you pay your premium and the insurance companies look after it and hand it back as claims. And at some point, and as long as they do that appropriately, then everything's okay. And so you've kind of got all of these rules of like regulation and capital standards and all this stuff to make sure that they've got enough money and they do the right things. I thought that that could be done in a programmatic fashion using smart contracts. And then all of a sudden you don't need all of this surrounding stuff. Do the insurance companies not also do like sort of the risk analysis and all that stuff? Or is that sort of outsourced to other entities? It's a combination. Um, but yeah, they do do that risk analysis and stuff as well. But I guess what I'm saying is that you need certain inputs like that and you'll need them in any way, shape or form. But I just saw that there was massive inefficiencies in the kind of agency risk. I mean, that's the whole reason actually the regulations exist is so that you make sure the insurance company does the right thing with the money and it's got enough to pay claims when they come. That's basically where we're thinking that this could be a whole lot more efficient. And also... Insurance is kind of historically has always kind of come from mutuals, like which are kind of community or people owned insurance companies rather than necessarily shareholder owned insurance companies. And so they kind of work for the, I mean, it's a very natural fit. Like you've got a community that shares risk together. If things go well, that they should all kind of benefit and they step in when times are bad. And so it's a very community native solution. And so that's kind of one of the reasons we wanted to do it was to kind of make a scalable mutual that everyone could join and scale the capital up, which is kind of one of the problems that mutuals have. But anyway, so it's kind of a, it's a very like native blockchain use case, in, in my opinion, it's always been talked about and it's hard to do. And I guess, yeah, wanted to give it a crack, given that we've got the expertise. You mentioned uh, mutual. Now, so my understanding is that there's different models of insurance and this, you know, mutual or mutual insurance is one of them. Can you explain like what mutual insurance is and how it differs from maybe the more standard insurance model? Yeah, I mean, there's kind of two general models. One's the mutual and one's the shareholder owned. Essentially, it just depends who owns the profits that, that come out of it, really. So a mutual, basically, if it, if it makes a surplus or a profit, makes a surplus at the end of the period, end of the year, then it essentially gives the money back to the members in some way, shape or form, whether that's through discounted premiums for next year or cash rebate or, or something like that. Um, that's how kind of how they work. And so there's always this view that we're working for for the members. And then obviously shareholder companies, um, it goes to pay the shareholders dividends, etc. Which is more common in the real world today? The shareholder companies largely dominate. There are a few big mutuals, but they tend to, um, mostly what happens is the, the mutuals get, tend to get swallowed up by the shareholder companies. And that's primarily because of capital efficiency. So mutuals can actually only raise money from their members. And if they're members of the community, then they're not actually you know, massively deep pocketed capital markets. Like that, that's kind of the reason you would shift to a shareholder based company that you can access more flexible capital, um, essentially. That has meant that a lot of the mutuals kind of demutualize. So they, what they do is they turn into a shareholder company, give the current members shares in the new shareholder company as kind of a proxy for their ownership. And that's kind of how it works. So mutuals have always have this structure or problem scaling up um, to big sizes. And that's kind of one of the reasons that design Nexus, the way we have trying to use token economics to assist in that scaling problem. And our theory and our goal is to kind of break that scaling issue that mutuals have and be able to get big. I didn't totally understand why the scaling problem exists for mutual companies. Can you explain that a little bit more? Simple example. If you've got 10 people in a mutual and they each put $1,000 in, 
then you've got ten thousand dollars. And so the most cover that you can provide is really like up to about ten thousand, or you know, because you have to have enough money to pay claims. If you get a hundred people all doing the same thing, that's fine. But to grow fast, you need to grow the actual. You need some money as capital to actually cover bigger and bigger、um, policies to start with. And so one of the problems that mutuals have is because they their members are usually just regular people. They don't. They don't like have a hundred million sitting in <laughs> in the bank. Then they have to essentially put limits, and、um, they can't grow as fast. So shareholder based companies essentially what they do is they just sell equity and just get a massive capital injection to kind of kickstart the process, and then they can sell really large policies and ramp up、um, quite quickly. And insurance is really a scale game. It's all about capital efficiency. Usually, the it's all about it. It's a huge leverage play. So, for example, you know, like banks are kind of leveraged, right? Insurance companies are even more leveraged. So they sell like many, many, many more times cover than they actually have capital to pay. So, if, like, basically, if everyone claimed at once, they would never have enough money. But the whole idea is that the likelihood of everyone claiming at once is so so low that it's okay. For example, like AIG covers about sixty times more amount of、um, risk than it does actually have capital on its books to pay. And so that's kind of a whole idea. And that ratio. That number becomes bigger and bigger the more diverse and bigger you are, and it's a big scale game. And so what happens is the mutuals grow; they have a good community product and service, and all the rest of it, and they grow to a certain point, and they need some extra money to grow bigger. And the, usually, the easiest way of accessing that is get bought out by a, a shareholder-owned insurance company or convert to a shareholder one themselves. It's kind of like the the back end of the insurance capital markets, really. That's kind of driving this stuff. So, given all of that, why is it Nexus Mutual then? If we seem to see that mutuals have these sort of scaling problems, why did you sort of design it in as a mutual model? The whole idea is that mutuals have this scaling problem because they can't get in; like they don't have any equity to sell, so they can't get in equity. But what you can do is actually you can tokenize the rights of the mutual, and while that's not actually getting in equity, it's actually getting in a more flexible. Capital structure, so you can have access to the same flexibility of the the capital, but without going outside the constraints of what a mutual is. A mutual can only raise money from the members, but you can still have a member that provides funds to the mutual and get tokens in return. But they're still kind of a member, and so you're kind of accessing the same type of capital or similar type of capital, but in a different way. And a blockchain native solution can actually make that happen really easily. And so essentially, we can use tokens to give us capital flexibility where mutuals don't have it right now. Are there like some sort of regulatory benefits to being a mutual, and is that why like? You kind of structure it as a mutual with like elements of shareholder based. This kind of goes into the question: as we do, you run a fully decentralized DeFi protocol versus what we're doing, which is kind of like this hybrid, which is effectively a DAO, but it's linked to a legal entity in the UK. And the primary reason we did that was because it gave us regulatory clarity, because insurance is like one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world, and so we wanted to. Be able to get some clarity on that side of things, and there's what's called a discretionary mutual structure in the UK, and that's specifically not regulated as insurance business. And so people use this today to sell mutuals. They've got like regular mutuals that you know, ex servicemen's mutuals, or retail shop owners' mutuals. Like there's like you know real real stuff. And so we're basically just using that structure and automating it via smart contracts. That gives us regulatory clarity. I guess the other element is that. We knew we couldn't build this in an absolutely fully decentralized way from day one, and so we couldn't like go the kind of full decentralized route. No regulatory, don't care about the regulations at all from day one. So we decided to go with this hybrid model, which gave us the clarity. Let's talk a little bit about what's the big vision for Nexus Mutual. Where do you want to see this project a decade from now? And when you think of the benefits that you think Nexus Mutual or maybe、uh, insurance solutions based on blockchain could bring in general, what are the most the biggest pros? I mean, what we're aiming for is, I guess, a decentralized version of Lloyd's of London. Anyone should be able to bring any risk they want covered, all that quirky stuff from any region in the world. Kind of in a permissionless basis, and they bring it to the mutual. And if the mutual wants to cover it, they can, and then the person can buy cover. 
a kind of route to that is more kind of stay within crypto because it's kind of fits with the niche. Like the our early users are going to be, we need, we're providing products for early users, essentially early adopters, and then move outside that as we grow and scale. That'll be a, a longish journey, but that's the kind of goal. Scale into a whole bunch of different things. And there are a whole bunch of underserved markets out there. Like mutuals work really well where you've got, we're not going to work like with auto cover in the US. That's like a heavily saturated market, highly competitive and stuff like that. Mutuals work well where you've got an underserved market with a specific need that's either niche or they can't get access for some other reason. The price is too high or whatever it is. And so mutuals work really well in that situation. And we think we can access those types of benefits, um, give access to those types of communities really quite easily and efficiently. Talk about why is insurance so important, like especially in the DeFi world. I was chatting with a friend once and he gave this like really great explanation to me about how insurance is trustlessness, where like you could go to a traditional company and say their systems are 99.9% secure. And we go pitch like blockchain to them and we're like no no look using our stuff you're 99.999 percent secure but they're like well in the centralized system that 0.1 percent of the time we're insured so for us that's trustless your system is not do you think that's like actually a fair representation of it when it comes down to it like every industry in the world has insurance for basically the reason that well, there's two real reasons. One, you don't necessarily have the capital yourself if something goes wrong. It's like you say, you could self-insure, right? Like, so if something goes wrong and you've got the money sitting in the bank, then you, to kind of get back to where you were, then you can decide to do that. That's fine. But obviously that doesn't work for the vast majority of people. Like you can't just rebuild the house if they have a fire or whatever. So that's kind of one reason. The other reason is like the marginal cost of getting from being 99% secure to 100% secure is really, really high. And so you're better off offloading that risk to a insurance company. And so I guess like natively, like the same conceptual um, thing applies in DeFi where everyone's really doing some um, really solid work on like smart contract security as an example. And, you know, different teams can afford different audits and verification and all that type of stuff. But you're never going to be able to get to 100% because the marginal cost of going from I'm really confident this doesn't have a bug to I'm absolutely sure that it doesn't is like just so astronomically high. And so it's much cheaper to actually get essentially an insurance product for that. It's been really interesting to like understand a bit how important insurance has been historically. Like the same friend who was actually explaining to me how like a lot of maritime law was actually sort of devised by Lloyd's of London as a way of setting the rules to like protect its own. You know, anyone who wants to get insurance from Lloyd's has to like abide by this, the laws that it sets for the sea and eventually those got canonized as like the maritime law. Ships is a good example, right? Like a lot of those ships, like the merchants wouldn't put their goods on the ships unless it was insured. And the people who are insuring it effectively said, you have to meet these standards, otherwise I'm not insuring it. And so it's kind of this standards type thing. And then once that happens, though, it actually just spurs massive economic activity because everyone's confident in things and they're protected with the downside. So, you know, you're much more willing to take risk if you know that the downside's protected. You know, like shooting a space in, a rocket into space, like that doesn't happen without insurance. Like no one's going to give you permission to launch a rocket unless you have an insurance policy in place. So, so, you know, it just applies in a kind of every single industry. And so I guess our thesis is like, you know, if DeFi is building a, or in, and Ethereum is building this parallel financial ecosystem, then we need some insurance to kind of make it work. Could you walk us through a little bit now about how does it work? Like, what would be the process? Let's say I'm a user of a protocol, let's say MakerDAO, right? I have some CDPs and I want to insure against smart contract risks on MakerDAO. Can you walk us through what the user process would be? I mean, it's relatively simple. Basically, you, you know, go to our app and select MakerDAO. So select what you want cover against, whether it's Maker or Compound or Uniswap or whatever. And then you choose how much cover you want. So for example, if you've locked up 100 ETH in your CDP, then you maybe want 100 ETH worth of cover if something goes wrong. And then you choose the time period so you want cover for three months or a year. And then you get a quote, it comes back. If you're happy with it, then you purchase it, pay the premium. You also have to sign up as a member of the mutual, which does involve a, a KYC process on our side because you join the legal company in the UK. But that's basically it. And then say an event happens, you know, there's a hack or whatever, then to submit a claim, you basically just 
submit the claim, one transaction, and then that triggers a an item, to, essentially a workflow item for our claims assessors to vote against. So there's a we specifically have a voting process here rather than a programmatic outcome. And the reason we kind of did that was it gives us heaps of flexibility in terms of what we can offer and what products we can offer. Essentially, what that means is the claims assessor, in aggregate, they're the oracle, they're bringing in the information, and they're they're making that assessment on, on average. And so, assuming it gets paid, then you automatically get paid your claim to your address, and that's kind of the, the complete user flow. So, who's doing this voting? Is it just the members of the mutual, or...? Members of the mutual. So any member of the mutual can decide if they want to optionally vote in the claims assessment. And to do that, they have to stake some of our native token to do that. And that's kind of their voting weight. And it's also their potential. It's like a bond. So if they, they vote maliciously, they can lose some of their bond. That's kind of the general process of how it works. How does this uh, native token work? Let's say I join the mutual. Do I get sort of awarded a fixed amount and is there a way to get more native token if you want to be a larger mutual holder larger members it's basically we actually run a bonding curve so we're actually one of the first live bonding curve projects out there which is interesting but the first step is you sign up as a member pay a very small membership fee and then you can decide to purchase nxm for ether um, so you put Ether into the mutual and based on the bonding curve price at the time, then you get NXM and you can always cash those NXM out for Ether if you wish. There's a few things you can do as kind of like an NXM holder. So you can vote in the claims assessment via staking the token against um, as your bond. And you can also get involved in what we call risk assessment, which is like the pricing side of things. So you can, for example, stake on Maker or Compound. Like basically you can pick this, the protocols that you think are secure. And then you earn rewards when people buy cover and you could potentially get burned if there's a claim. So there's kind of a plus and minus there. And you can also like voting governance actions as well. Those are kind of the three kind of expert level stuff that you can kind of come in. And so you can buy as more tokens free through it as you wish. So one thing I found interesting here is that you have these actions like, you know, you mentioned uh, the thing of like, okay, you can stake tokens on a particular protocol to say a smart contract to say like, oh, I think this is secure. And basically you're putting up some sort of collateral uh, to back that and you make money based on based on the amount of collateral. You know, but at the same time, right, you have like various investors who are, you know, these VC funds who like, they may be knowledgeable about like, you know, crypto on a high level and stuff, but not about uh, smart contract security. So, I mean, it seems like the natural thing here would be to have some sort of, you know, delegation function, right? Where there are people who are like specialize on risk assessment, other, others on some other function, others that have capital and there's some sort of, uh, you know, basically deal between them similar to, you know, proof of stake with like validators and token holders. Is that something you're considering or does that make sense to you? No, I mean, it does make complete sense. Um, and it is something we're considering. I, I think um, we're probably the first steps are going to be, uh, we're actually releasing a new staking mechanism very soon. And the main aim of that is to make the process a bit simpler and also enhance the rewards for, for the staking. So kind of we're focused on that to start with, but um, then we're going to be looking at things like, um, like step one might be, you know, allowing you to easily follow someone else. So just kind of copy someone else's staking um, process, but then also, you know, enhance the system so you can specifically delegate if you wish. So yeah, that, I mean, that makes, it does make complete sense to do that. It's very easy to just like sort of copy what someone else is doing. Let's say I just see what, you know, you know, o open Zeppelin, I just go ahead and just automatically copy whatever they do. Do you think that it's like they might be getting sort of under rewarded for the amount of work that they're doing in the system? Like they're the ones sort of doing a lot of the actual, like I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm put, I'm putting a lot of capital risk, but how do we make sure that they are sort of appropriately rewarded for the amount of contribution that they do? Yeah. I mean, you're always going to be able to follow someone else. So like we can't actually prevent, prevent that. So I think the important point is that especially like with people like open Zeppelin and stuff, like, I mean, if they want to get more involved, they, they can earn more rewards you know they they it's up to them to kind of decide how much want to, money they want to put at risk if they're happy to happy to back themselves a lot um then they, they can get more but with the delegation maybe we can have like a you know a, a fee 
aspect to it as well <laughs> that you know maybe the the person who delegates keeps only 90 percent of the rewards and 10 percent go to the person they're delegating to or you know some, something like that um so if you if you want to delegate to someone like they, they maybe have a fee on top or something so there's definitely models around that that we can that um that we're potentially looking at to to make make that process easier mm -hmm. so yeah could you maybe talk a little bit about how the how does this whole price discovery part work because obviously this is one of the most complex things in any insurance system and you know we had open on last week and even for them you know how to do the initial price discovery is one of always one of the hardest parts so we walk through a bit about how, how that works at nexus mutual yeah so um i guess another thing that's soon to be changing very soon um but but essentially if we boil it down it's basically staking so there's a, there's a, going to be a formula behind risk um, and the more that's staked on that specific risk, the lower the price. So it's kind of like, conceptually, it's like using a prediction market, but it's a bit more structured. That essentially, you just kind of one measure and and the not very much stakes, obviously a high price, and then it comes down um, in a bit of a um, curve. So the more and more stakes you get, the um, the lower the price with, the, with minimums and stuff. Um, so what are stakers doing here? They are staking on the security of particular contracts? Yep. That's correct. And so if, let's say, there is a bug in that contract, the stakers, their MXN gets sort of seized first before the claims are made out from the main pool. Is that sort of the main risk that the stakers are taking on? Yeah, basically. So what, what happens is it's like NX, the, there's one capital pool where all of the funds live. They're basically, anyone who wants to purchase an exempt for Ether or anyone, um, whenever um, someone pays a cover amount and it goes into the common pool and claims go out of that pool as well. And also investment earnings on the pool just stay in the pool. So that's kind of conceptually, there's just one pool of funds. And that's kind of how insurance entities like work. They kind of like aggregate the capital altogether. So that's, that's kind of the first concept. And then over the top of that is like the incentive layer, which is the staking and the reward mechanisms and stuff. And so when a claim is paid, the, the ether or die, which you bought the cover in, gets actually paid from the capital pool. And concurrently, the stakers would get burned um, up to the claim amount if there's enough stake. Sometimes there may not be enough stake. Um, so it may not kind of be fully covered by stake, but the kind of mutual would be taking the risk by itself then. But essentially, if there, are, if there is staking, it, it, get, uh, um, it gets paid When first. you say burnt, I mean, you have this capital pool where the things kind of accumulate. And then, you know, out of this, let's say MXN is paid uh, to cover a claim. So when you say, oh, the stakers now get burned, basically it means... There's not like literally tokens being burned, but that there is some part of the capital pool that, you know, was allocated to those stakers before. And now it basically gets kind of appropriated. So I, don't know, I think the whole idea is that you've, you've got like one, one, to, one like to token, a whole bunch of tokens sitting over the top of the capital pool. And they kind of have shared ownership of the capital pool because they're like the members, they're membership rights, right? And so um, whenever someone puts money into the mutual, they get more membership rights. So it's on the, on the bonding curve. So that's kind of step one. And then, and then what you can do after that um, is, is kind of the staking. So uh, perhaps conceptually, it's easier to kind of just stop there for the moment. And if you're just a holding NXM, for example, then you're a member of the mutual. And to the extent that the mutual makes a surplus, like so essentially the cover prices exceed the claim payments and the investment earnings of the, the capital pool, then you get you get your kind of um, part of that. So you get to kind of, I guess, share in that um, side of things. Then as an additional optional step, you can increase your risk reward position if you'd like to by staking. And if you stake, then when someone else purchases cover, you earn additional NXM tokens. And if there's a potential claim, or if there's a claim, then you can potentially get burned. Yeah, I guess you can take different risk reward positions depending on what your appetite yeah. is and, and what type of member you'd like to be. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, one of the things when you know, I was reading through your you know explanations on the website that stood out to me and, and I found it a little bit strange, maybe you can explain it. So... If I'm buying, I'm buying some insurance coverage, right? And let's say I'm paying 100 MXN for, for this insurance coverage. 
then the way it's said in the in the documentation is that 90 MXN of those get burned and 10 get kind of allocated for a future, you know, if I want to make a claim, I have to put up a little bit of uh, deposit. At the same time, you say there's 20% of the cover paid, which gets paid out to, to the stakers. So, the, I mean, it seems, does, does that mean you're like burning MXN and then at the same time you're like minting? Let's say in this case we have 100. So you're burning 90 and you're minting 20 to pay out to the stakers? Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, rather than like kind of, um, it's easiest to kind of look through and look at the net result right. after, after, after everything, right? And, and so the whole idea here is that basically from a user point of view, you actually buy cover in either Ether or DAI. And then what happens is step one, this happens all in one, one transaction. Step one, you buy, so you put, say you're buying cover in Ether, it converts it to NXM and then it burns 90% of that NXM because it buys it on the bonding curve yeah. and then destroys it immediately. Right. So it's kind of a side point. So it really the Ether goes into this, uh, in the pool. And then it, and it would be like, Let's say I can say, and I just want to buy MXN. I don't want to cover. So I'm putting Ether in the pool and I'm getting MXN from this bonding curve. Whereas, you know, Sonny, he doesn't care about MXN. He just wants insurance cover. So he's putting Ether in the pool. The same thing happens. MXN gets taken out, but then he doesn't get the MXN, but that gets burned. Or, or yeah, slash yeah. 70% gets burned. 20% quasi gets to some stakers for that contract and 10% he kind of keeps for, you know, to take future actions around his insurance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, and, and so, I mean, I guess it's important. So like all of these kind of metrics and stuff, we're kind of, we're basing them on like insurance company economics. So that's kind of the whole idea being that we um, we price the cover at the right levels. You know, obviously we don't know what the claims are going to be right now. We need a bit more experience and stuff like that. But the conceptually, the idea is to leave a little bit of surplus in the pool, and also for that ten percent for the cover purchases. That's kind of ideally, it's kind of like the mutual. Like you can cash that out at the end if you'd like to, or you can use it to buy discounted cover next time around. So it's kind of like your ongoing participation in the mutual. So it's conceptually, that's it's that's how mutuals work. So going back to that question about the uh, sort of price discovery. So alongside the staking, there's like other things that are taken into account as well. I, I read about like, you know, sort of how long a contract has existed. And so can you talk about some of what are some of the other factors that also get sort of. Yeah. So, um, th I mean, that's really interesting. So we've, um, it basically is kind of trying to proxy how battle tested the contract is, how much it's been used, how much funds has it got, how long has it been on main and how many transactions does it have? And so that was, um, that's kind of that, that initial pr pricing algorithm was kind of our first attempt at kind of blending old insurance world with staking mechanisms and stuff. We've, we've worked a lot on, on these pricing stuff over the past, I guess we've been on mainnet about a year now. Um, so we've got a little bit of experience on stuff. We haven't got many claims. We paid out in the BZX one, but we, that's that's it so far. But what we've learned is that that algorithm doesn't work the best in the situations, in all situations. And so what we're going to do is actually simplify that down and just bring it back down to staking. And so cons what we're trying to do here is like bring the minimum amount of information on chain and allow people like if, if someone's got like a really awesome um, model to assess smart contract risk, they can do that and they can run that off chain, they can do whatever they want. And then they can essentially condense that information into whatever they want to stake. And then they just put that on chain. And so the idea being that we don't care what tools you use or how you actually come up with your view, but we just care how much money you put behind it. And so that's going to work for smart contract cover, but that pricing mechanism can actually work for anything. Because it doesn't actually reference anything about the particular risk; it just references the state. So, if you want to like offer earthquake cover or a hurricane cover or like or any, anything, you can you can effectively do it using the same mechanism. And so, that's kind of one of the real goals that we're trying to get to longer term. How do you account for correlation then here? Right now, you don't cover Oracle risk, but let's you know, at, let's say eventually you do. A lot of stuff does. Take, like depend on, for example, the maker oracles particularly, and that's like this point of correlation. So, does accounting for the higher, you know, maybe because of that correlation, you maybe need higher premiums for contracts that do 
have like maker that touch the maker oracles is this something that would also be accounted for within the staking system or is there additional functionality that's needed to do that no so i mean generally the best way of managing correlation risks through capacity constraints rather than through pricing just in general with insurance that's kind of how it works you don't you don't want to like basically you know if you take you know you're exposed to like business insurance in um new orleans like you know if a or like a whole bunch of different insurance like if a hurricane hits they're all gonna go at the same time so you basically limit your total capacity to that type of event that's the kind of best way of dealing with it rather than through specific granular pricing so that's kind of the way we're headed as well. Um, to be honest, it's we're still kind of working out the best ways of actually capping and managing those correlations. Um, we've definitely got some few ideas, but that's definitely really kind of higher level expert stuff that we're trying to work out the best and most efficient ways to get an inf- information on chain. But it's more likely to be managed by a hold on. We're going to make sure that these five risks are grouped together and their total capacity is not greater than X so that you know you can... They can move in between that, but as long as we kind of cap the total so that the mutual doesn't go bust if there's like one event that hits five things. So we have some limits now that are a bit more crude, but we're going to be looking to ways to manage that a bit better in the future. And right now you do only the smart contract risk. What are sort of the plans to expand here? And and what kind of happens when things get the lines sort of get blurred so you know oracles are a, are a good example of it sort of blurring the lines or i just read just last night that there was like some bug found in the argent wallet and argent is sort of this like interesting thing where it's like half of the stuff is being done on using smart contracts but then a lot of the stuff also comes from like you know their app and like you know would you also cover like it's oftentimes clients need to be smart in order to know how to interact properly with smart contracts. And if the clients have a bug and just incorrectly with smart contracts, does that count as something that's covered by Nexus Mutual right now? Um, not right now. So we definitely, we focus down onto the, essentially solidity cover is probably a better actual description of what we're offering. So technical risk in the solidity contracts. Um, so, you know, if you, if you send the wrong information to the particular contract because the UI had a bug, then that's, that's not covered kind of thing. Um, and same, and I guess same with the oracles right now. Um, ha- having said that, we, we started there because we felt it was a kind of contained thing that we could like at least get some handle on. I mean, it's completely new risk anyway that no one else was writing. But we thought we'd start there. But the plan is definitely to expand because, you know, if you're interacting with DeFi, you basically want comprehensive cover in, say, in case something goes wrong. And so that's, we know that the customers and, um, and members want that. Um, it's just about working out how we actually get there in a, in a good way that we can actually define the terms and when a claim is valid and when it's not and, and how you price for that and stuff like that. So we've got some good um, ideas on that and, um, and the, essentially build on the architecture that we've got and we're, we're looking to um, do them in the near future as well. So what are the volumes uh you have so far like let's say if you take something like compound or like oh, what are the most popular insurance policies you have and how much insurance has so far been taken out so we've written uh, nearly up to nine nine million worth of cover um so far we've got about four and a half million outstanding right now and the big ones are <laughs> surprise surprise compound of a balancer anything with yield farming right now is a, is a big um is a big one curves also really pro- popular and so it's basically the the really solid use case for us right now is like you can earn yield in DeFi via whatever method and then you can pay a lower amount and get some cover and then you kind of project it against a, a large chunk of the risk and so that's 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 the big use case cool and and so like what's the amount you have to pay to get like let's say I mean, I don't know. On I guess on compound, right? Most most rates are kind of low, but maybe die or something like I think the, or tether. I think the stable coins are kind of high. So like, let's say I would want to buy a year's worth insurance there. Like, how much would that cost? Yeah. So right now the rates on compound and most of the other big ones are one is one point three percent per annum. So that's works quite well when you're earning five, six, seven, or ten or whatever. You know, obviously it depends. When the DSR went to zero, and that was kind of the if that's kind of the risk-free rate, not cl- close to it, I don't know, then everything else kind of followed. Um, we weren't selling as much cover over the last three to six months, but recently with, um, you know, Tether 
being able to get you know 10 on on compound and stuff everyone's um, really really interested in this stuff again so yeah that's that's we kind of we kind of go along with the with DeFi for the ride how do you deal with sort of like perverse incentive stuff that are off, like you know you don't cover oracle risk so there's no issue with that but like what about like you know, let's say I'm an attacker and I found a bug in a smart contract. I can sort of double my payout by first taking out insurance and then doing an attack, right? How do you, is this something you do need to cover or? There, there isn't right now. So you can essentially do it like a naked cover if you want to describe it like that. So it's kind of like a credit default swap or something. Um, so yeah, look, this, it, it does lead to potential issues. We, we started that way because it was simple. Um, to do i think in a a, what we want to do is actually have some level of proving of loss which effectively takes away most of that kind of attack type issue there however i mean the the risk is still out there and like if if there is a bug there is a bug i guess there's a soft control we do have kyc so right now um we don't want to kind of rely on that as a um prevention again against attacks but it it does it's a soft one against hackers so yeah, look, I think with all things insurance, you can never do this stuff 100%. There's always going to be um, a way of potentially defrauding the system. Um, and the, the way, you, what you have to do as a kind of provider is get that down to a costly enough level or a small enough level so that it still works as a whole. Because obviously if it's too high, the whole, the whole system breaks down. Yeah, look, we're, we're definitely still learning on that front and we're adjusting economics incentives and those types of things to to gain experience and things like that. So, yeah, I'm not saying we've got this completely 100% solved right now. Um, we're definitely iterating. Could you talk a little bit about how this sort of compares to other models of insurance on uh, in the DeFi world? So prediction markets, which I, get, I in my opinion, this actually seems sort of very similar to prediction markets in ma- in many ways. And then the other would be something more more like Open, who we just had on the show last week, yep. where they do more of a financialized approach to it. Yeah, so, I mean, th- is this essentially comes down, like derivatives or prediction markets, I kind of put them in the same, a similar type of bucket. And insurance pools, like th- there's always going to be overlap there, at, but they are actually distinct products in my mind. And it comes actually comes back to the capital models and how it, how the capital's set up. For example, if on open and on prediction markets, they have to be fully collateralized. And on open, they have to be more than fully collateralized, um, which means if you sell $1,000 worth of cover, you have to have on open 1,300 or something. I can't quite remember what the collateralization ratio is. And on a prediction market, you have to have 1,000 like in the pot so that if the event happens, you've definitely got enough money to pay. You know, essentially the premium goes from the, person who wants cover to the capital provider. And if you're writing risks that are l- quite likely to happen, like, I don't know, 10 to 20% likely to happen, then that's a reasonable premium to go to a capital provider. If you're talking about extreme risks that are very unlikely to happen, so say like a 1% type event, if you're a capital provider backing a 1% event one-to-one, then the most you can earn is 1%. And so it's very hard to attract capital on a fully collateralized basis for that type of risk. So what happens is insurance pools effectively allow you to under collateralize. They allow you to gear up. So Nexus can at least gear six times right now and, it can, and we're aiming to gear um, more. So we're currently riding at about 120, 130%. So we're under collateralized right now, which sounds bad, but it's actually kind of the whole point of what we're doing. And so that means it's more capital efficient. So what insurance pools work really well for kind of extreme events that you need to diversify the risk across. That's the whole point. You've got one capital pool covering lots of different risks. Options and like prediction markets and stuff, they work better when you've got like more at the money type risks. So um, like open and stuff are getting some really great success on like the F put options and stuff because the likelihood of something happening is a lot higher than 1%. It's, you know, they're writing put options at close to the money or whatever. So um, that, that, that's basically w- what it comes down to. Um, they're, they're very related products, but it all comes back to that capital efficiency point. So two months ago, uh, or two or three months ago, you, uh, you guys did make out your first actual payment from Texas Mutual. Uh, could you walk us through the whole story of 
how it worked in practice. And, uh, you know, there was this whole thing where, like, the there was first some claims made and it was rejected. And then later it was accepted. Can you walk us through why and what happened? Yeah, it was a really interesting time for us. And it was, I guess, really great that we ended up paying claims because that's kind of the whole point of what we're trying to do. But, yeah, so the BZX hat hacks or events whatever you want to call them um happened um there were two different events and they were two days apart so one was on a friday and one was on a sunday and so what happened was um essentially both of them were quite complex transactions involving a flash loan um set up and then manipulating an on-chain price oracle and then profiting from it at the end and so on on friday the first event happened within 12 hours or something someone submitted a claim and and based on the information available at the time it looked like it was basically a clever arbitrage trade using a oracle manipulation and stuff which and so and it appeared as though the contracts operated as intended and there was nothing wrong with them um and so because of that the mutual members declined the claim no there was no bug in the solidity code however then I don't know, another like within kind of 12, 24 or 36 hours after the event, the BZX team um, put out the details of, of their kind of post-mortem and it highlighted that there was a smart contract trigger that they were in, that they intended to actually prevent an under loan resulting after all of this, um, but it didn't fire. And so effectively it was bypassed. And then because of that, the um, the claimant resubmitted, so you can submit your claim twice. Um, and because of this new information available, the claim successors approved it. That's basically what happened. It was just a, really a timing issue based on the information available. Um, when the when the events happened, one of the first things that we did was basically say to everyone that has cover, please don't submit claims for another day or so, so that you know we have some information and people have done some analysis on this type of stuff. So yeah, I mean overall, we were really happy that kind of we tested all kind of elements of the system. And I guess one other interesting aspect. How quickly are claims decided upon? Like, you know, were, were they sort of have to have been acted upon within 24 hours? Like, why why couldn't we, like, wait a week before deciding whether or not to approve or reject the claim? Yeah, there's there's some there's some time limits. And there was a, there's, like, a minimum of, at the time, we've, we've made these longer now, but at the time there was a minimum 12-hour voting and a maximum 48-hour voting. And basically... But once you get like a certain voting power, it just closes automatically after 12 hours. So that's kind of what happened. So yeah, we, we've extended those time periods to kind of handle this type of thing. I guess the other other interesting aspect of like, we, we've had like quite a few claims votes now, but, but all of them have been like over 99% of people voting in the one direction. Like, so basically there's been like a very, very high level of consensus about what the what the result was, even if the Discord channel is flooded by... Lots of people sc- screaming at each other, um, which is which is interesting in and of itself. Cool. Uh, this is really awesome, and I'm super excited to see how this is going to play out. Now, maybe we can just spend I don't know two or three minutes on this topic. But I mean, I know you want to go beyond smart contract covers, also to cover you know maybe real world risks. What do you think are the most promising, you know, sort of types of insurance coverage that you can write? And what what's going to be the biggest change you have to go through to go from, you know, like purely blockchain to, you know, this hybrid blockchain physical world scenario? Yeah, so I think one thing that's kind of critical to make stuff work right now, especially, is the fact that to assess claims, you actually need some data source or information um, to to assess them, and so that kind of naturally pulls you into risks. Initially, risks like earthquake or hurricane or something, where you've got solid data coming from multiple data sources about where events happened and stuff like that, and crop insurance and because so, you've got satellite data and stuff like that. So that's the those are the types of risks that are more likely to be the first non blockchain native stuff. So the big the big things that have to happen for that to become a reality, one fiat on off ramps and <laughs> so that it, that are slick to kind of abstract away all of the blockchain stuff behind the the scenes, so that regular people can just use an app and um, click a few buttons and and it's done. The the whole idea of Nexus is that you get a distributor that creates an app for earthquake cover in Mexico or whatever, and they um, own the distribution there, and then we Nexus provides essentially the risk capital in- directly into the application, and so they're actually buying cover with Nexus, but 
Nexus isn't doing the distribution and customer facing stuff. It's done by partners that are local and um, understand the products and the markets and stuff like that. That's that's where these types of solutions tend to work very well. So that's kind of kind of need that tech side. And I guess the other the other thing is you also need a few experts in the mutual that are interested in doing that type of stuff. So right now we've got a whole bunch of crypto experts that are interested in crypto related risks, but to expand into different types of risks, you're also going to need some community members that actually have knowledge about those types of things. And so you kind of have to grow um, into those things slowly with your membership base. Let's uh, just touch on the last topic, which is um, you have this hybrid thing of the, the legal entity and the DAO like what is the relationship between the two? They're one and the same thing. So the the well, the legal entity is operated by smart contracts running on Ethereum. So that's kind of how how it works. There are yeah legal documents that kind of describe the, these are the rules. And if there's any disagreement between how the thing operates, just look at the smart contracts. Um, that that's the final determinant. And then when um when you want to change things, like you have to go through a governance vote, and all of that's kind of prescribed in the Legal documents as a sync, they're kind of synced up. And basically, when there's a, a governance vote, that means the terms and conditions of the mutual are essentially updated. Um, and so it all kind of works in sync, which is which is kind of cool. And I mean, there are a few of these more coming out, but we were guess one of the one of the early ones to do it as well. I guess one other interesting aspect is um, which you mentioned right at the start was that there are actually four or uh, five um, board members of Nexus, and they are the legal directors of the company. And they have some slight, slightly high powers within the system, but there's that kind of link to the to kind of the traditional world, I guess. Does this allow you to hold sort of assets outside of on chain? So could sort of the insurance pool also hold some I don't know Swiss francs in in a bank account somewhere? Is that is that one of the benefits of this? It, it could do, and that, I guess that is a benefit, but it wouldn't be referenced by the token price, so. It, um, we, we're trying not to do that. One one of the big benefits it has, I guess there's two real big benefits. One, it gives limited liability on a per member basis. So you've join, you're joining a legal company in the UK. Um, if so, the DAO does something wrong, you uh, only limited, your liability is limited to one pound. That's kind of the structure of the membership organization. Rather than if you are joining a DAO without this legal wrapper, then you're potentially liable on a personal basis for anything the DAO does. I mean, that could be quite an extreme view, but you know, that's that's one of the benefits it gets. And going back to you know, close to the beginning, you mentioned that one of the things that insurance companies do is like, you know, what regulation does is that it provides a lot of like capital requirements and stuff. Is there something similar to FDIC, but for insurance? Like essentially governments have deemed that bank accounts are like a vital enough part of like the economy that you know they provide insurance do, does the government all do governments also provide insurance like reinsurance to these insurance companies no not specifically but they do set they do have like government sponsored pools for certain things that it's often hard to get coverage for for example there's like terrorism related pools or flood related pools or something like that um where you know the the insurance industry may not be happy taking it on so you kind of a nationalized part of it or provide some subsidies or something um but but in, in general like the government there's also this concept of being a systemically important insurer um which kind of means that you have to pay some extra fees <laughs> to governments and stuff so that you know they recognize that if you if that insurance company does go down it's going to cause massive economic impacts so they do extra to prop it up i guess What's ahead? Like, what are, if you look at the next 12 months, what are the main milestones you hope to achieve? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of work coming out, as I kind of mentioned pretty soon, on like uh, pooled staking and pricing and kind of incentive um, tweaking and stuff like that. Um, that's really important for us. And then, and then the, two, the two kind of biggest things that we want to focus on are, one, scaling the, the mutuals capital pool and growing so we can meet the demand that we've got because a lot of people want lots of cover. We can't quite get everyone covered right now. But um, that's kind of that's kind of one thing, and then also working on distribution and um, um, sales and um, integrations and, and things like that to make it easier to purchase cover. So yeah, rather than kind of coming to our site to buy cover, we want the vast majority of people to buy cover off our site wherever they're interacting with DeFi, whether that's through Argent or uh, Zerion or, or whatever they're doing. So that's that's the type of thing that, that we're, we're looking to focus on, and yeah, just kind of growing and growing along with DeFi. That's that's our main plan. 
Cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Hugh. I mean, it's really impressive where you've come, and I think this is really uh, super cool that this is live and functional, and i um, thrilled to see where you're going to take it in the next few years. Cool. No, yeah, thank you very much, and yeah, great to be on, and great to talk to you both. It doesn't end here. There's much more to this conversation, and you can hear it by signing up for Epicenter Premium. As a premium subscriber, you'll get access to a private RSS feed where you can hear the interview debrief, which goes on for an extra 20 minutes. You'll also get exclusive access to roundtable conversations with Epicenter hosts and bonus content you won't hear anywhere else. Go to epicenter.rocks slash premium to join the community and support the podcast.